So this is a photo of my grandfather. He's uh, showing me what a slide roll is, and he's super excited about it. Um, if it wasn't already obvious from looking at this picture alone, my grandfather is kind of a nerd. Um, <laughs> None of us are nerds here. Um, he went to MIT for physics, and he's like a super, super smart guy. Um, he's actually so smart that my grandmother tells this story about him, and it goes like this. So they're newlyweds, and they buy a camera, and my grandmother is really excited to like take photos of you know like the the dog and the baby. My grandfather, on the other hand, is like, I'm going to learn everything there is to know about photography. And so he goes to the library, and he checks out a bunch of books, and he like, checks out all these things on like photography and cameras and like the physics of light. Um, he, then he goes and he like, shoots a bunch of rolls of film. Um, and then this is, this is the best part. He, um, he turns his mother-in-law's kitchen into a dark room on like a weekend visit, because you, know, you wouldn't want to do it to your own kitchen. Um, <laughs> Goodness gracious. Um, and at the end of all this, he like cleans everything up like, and then just like completely drops it. Like He moves on to the next thing. Um, I think the next thing was taking apart the sewing machine that they had gotten as a wedding present, but I'm not sure. <laughs> so my grandmother, who's like finally gotten her hands on the camera, is like, how do you use the camera, Fred? I don't understand all the buttons. And he goes, in reply, well, before you start doing photography, you have to understand the history of photography and how light works and how light refracts through a camera. <laughs> what? Wait, what? <laughs> that my my grandfather didn't think the camera was scary because that was how he learned. He got a bunch of books and he would just read all of them and he would learn about the inner workings and the history and read the manual and learn how to shoot and doing all that work was really overwhelming to my grandmother who like just wanted enough info to get started. She just wanted to do it. Like she just wanted to know how the buttons worked, right? Um, and so I chalked this up to the two of them having two very different styles of learning and neither one's right or wrong. It's just, you know, like different goals, different desires. So I call them like the Grampy Way and the Bosway because that's like what I call my grandparents. Um, and so trying to level up your skills can feel like this and can be really overwhelming and frustrating. Like you walk into the room of the internet and everyone learns differently. Um, and I personally commiserate a little bit more with my grandmother than my grandfather. And so when this happens, it takes very little for me to just feel terrified. Um, I feel terrified all the time doing web development. And show of hands for the brave, who else feels this way with me? Oh, thank god. I was really scared no one would raise their hands. And I'd be like, I guess I'm the only one. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this I chalk up to the fact that like, you know, beginner tutorials are all over the place, but learning intermediate and advanced skills are just a little different. And so I think that this feeling is normal. And this is, I think, stressful because it's just stressful to exercise your best judgment as to what the best course for you is, specifically you, when programming becomes less about basics and more about opinion and technique. OK, so right, prototypal inheritance. That's the name of this talk, right? So I consider this like the worst sucker of the bunch if you write JavaScript a lot, because it's lauded as like the most confusing and complicated aspect of the language that we're writing all the time. And that can make learning it feel really daunting. So since we all learn differently, I kind of want to tackle going through this talk in both ways. Like I want to, for those of you who like, totally like, her grandfather sounds like me. <laughs> and then for all of you who are like, no, I just want to learn like how to use the buttons and just like get started, I want to like give you the resources to do that too. So I also want to help dispel some of the confusion surrounding prototypal inheritance, like its history, why everyone acts like it's so complicated, controversies with JavaScript language, so that when you're and also go over some code examples so that when you're like looking at Stack Overflow later, you can understand why people are fighting so vehemently about like what they consider the best way to do something. Um, so it's 1995. <laughs> you like that pose? OK. So a man named Brendan Ike is working for Netscape, and he's making a language. And because it's the 90s, Java is king. That language, uh, awful. Okay, just kidding. Um, <laughs> so at this point, it's becoming obvious that like the web was a force to be reckoned with, and it was going to revolutionize the way we thought about the world. But we were still very much in like like this world, um, and so like the web was still a baby. Um, 
and so it was a marketing move, like the name of the language, which was like LiveScript for a little bit, and then it was MochaScript, and then it got changed to JavaScript. And you see, this, the reason for this was that the original creators were hoping to boost its popularity with its name, and by even making the language look a certain way. So like, this is some Java, um, public static void main. Sure, you guys have written those words before. Um, so this is, you know, like we see semicolons and we see um, curly braces. And they did this in order to drive adoption. So here's actually, Brendan Ike even said that's what he was told to do. They're in quotation marks, make it look like Java. Um, so while this might not sound like a good reason to change the design of your language um, or to shape it in a particular way, I actually want to take a second to look at SAS. Um, and the reason why is because other than its initial spike in search history at its creation, SAS interest didn't really begin to like just steadily climb until SAS 3.0, which came out in 2010. And so it's, and of course, for those of you who perhaps don't write a ton of SAS, like SCSS came out with SAS 3.0, and it looked like CSS. So all of these people who thought that the SAS variant of SAS, if that makes sense, um, which looked like Ruby and just felt scary, SCSS felt familiar. And so like having something feel familiar, even with us rough and tumble developer types, can really drive adoption and interest. So the only problem with this move, um, sorry guys. Oh my goodness, I'm so nervous right now. Look at like my talk just dying. <laughs> Where is my mouse? How do I use computers? <laughs> I can do it. Okay, thank goodness. So the only problem was this, was that this move caused us to make some assumptions about JavaScript that were just wrong. Namely that JavaScript inheritance worked like it does in Java or in C++ and it doesn't. So. So some people began learning JavaScript and they like embraced this. They were like, I love prototypal inheritance and others didn't. And then of course you throw in the fact that like all of us as developers are at all different skill levels. And then you have like this clamor or blog posts that are saying like prototypal inheritance is super confusing and really hard. And then other people are saying, nah, it's really easy. Like you just don't get it. Um, <laughs> that's like the, well actually cat from yesterday, you know. <laughs> um, and, they're all trying to give code examples that just didn't feel applicable to the code we normally write for the web. So one of the best examples, or so Alex Sexton actually has like this great post where he goes over the ways we try and explain prototypal inheritance and then makes fun of all of them because they're all awful. And the most notorious example of this is actually like the talking animals to describe objects that we give function, like that we give functionality. And it's so ubiquitous that people love to make fun of it as an example. So here's a tweet. And on the sixth day, God created an abundance of talking animals that they may be used in JavaScript inheritance examples. Thanks. So the only problem is that as an example, like, pe like people actually use this example a lot. And so like remember that part where we all raised our hands and we said that like learning things on the web is hard? Like that's one of the reasons for it. So what is prototypal inheritance then? We like haven't actually defined it yet. So first of all, it's important to know that everything in JavaScript is an object. And these objects have internal links to each other, which are relationships, which are called their prototypes. And this remains true until you reach null, which is considered the end of the prototype chain. That's an object literal. Conferences are fun. So let's look at a code example. So here we're creating, oh goodness, someone's tweeting at me. I hope they're saying something nice. <laughs> So the first thing we're doing here is we're creating an object literal. <laughs> oh goodness, anyway. <laughs> so it's just an object that we haven't attached to anything. Um, it's just an object and we're calling it user and we're giving it a function called tweet. Oh, it's just the thing that just happened. Um, <laughs> and it takes a string and if that string is less than 140 characters, we return the string and the name of the user tweeting it. And at this point, like, we have no idea what the user's username is gonna be. So then we create a username, Helen V. Holmes. Hello. And here's where the magical inheritance stuff starts with like that 
uh, object.create user. So here we're saying that Helen B. Holmes is an object that inherits from user, and we're filling in, in that last line, that last piece of information, which is like the this.username that you saw in the tweet function earlier, which is nice. So now as we set up users, we can set them up so that they all have user as their prototype. And this is like basic object-oriented stuff, which is awesome. So what's also cool is that we can assign properties sort of like all over the chain, and we can check for those properties later. So say I look for a property on Helen B. Holmes, a Helen B. Holmes object, and it isn't there. So that's me.car. We don't know what my car is, or at least JavaScript doesn't. Um, say I look for a property on the Helen B. Holmes object, and it isn't there. JavaScript's smart enough to to look to see if the property exists on its prototype, and then its prototype's prototype, until it either finds it or it reaches null and gives up and says, gives you an error. So JavaScript's pretty fun because in all these examples, everything is an object. So this is interesting because any object can spit out new objects, any object can become the prototype for a different object, and objects aren't limited to the properties of their prototype. In fact, every object you ever create can have different methods than all of the other objects in your ecosystem. So this is just JavaScript letting you do what you need to do in order to describe your world, which is cool. People love JavaScript. This is why. So I have another example for you. Um, let's say we have a very specific user that's like a regular, ad, regular user, an admin, and then also like a super admin. He has like a Twitter shirt on. So call him a power user. And they're a power user because they're allowed to flush the database. So this person is allowed to delete everything on Twitter. <laughs> that's why they're so special. What an odd power. Uh, <laughs> It's like the lamest superpower ever. I can flush databases. So this will also illustrate another um, instance where prototypes are really rad, which is multi multiple inheritance, which we'll be doing through like a new ES6 feature called object.assign, which emulates the way that we use mixins currently in ES5. So we're going to create a special power user that inherits the properties of both the regular admin user and then the properties of the first user we created above. So like that one more step in our chain. All right. I need to scroll, I'm sorry guys. Computers are so hard. There we go, okay. So I scrolled past like the user code because you've already seen it. So object.create user, you've seen all that stuff. So the new stuff in here is that we're creating an admin object and he has like a couple things. He can view the database, he can also write to the database. Um, and then for this last thing, um, you see like this power user that we're finally creating. So for our power user, you'll see that we have like these two properties. Um, he has his username, which is Twitter. Twitter can flush the database. Um, and that's set to true. And then we also have this object.assign method um, where we're creating a new object, applying the properties of user and admin to it, and then assigning those last two properties of like username is Twitter, he can flush the database. So now we can do stuff like this. So if we console log, Power user dot can flush database we get true and that makes sense because like we just did it and then if we do power user dot can view database we can view database we still get true because JavaScript is like well that's not on power user so that like goes up to the next prototype and it, then it finds the property there and then lastly we can do like power user dot tweet and then we get that function that tweet function that we defined earlier at like the very beginning. What's really cool about this stuff is like the ability to monkey patch classes or like add-on functionality as you go along. So say like I create my user, like you've seen like this user code like five times, so I won't go over it. But say later on I'm like, I want to add direct messages. So I do user.directmessage and then like a message string and then a to user and then like code. Now our user has a direct message method. So actually scattering functions all over your code like this, like actually doesn't really make for clean code. But um, it does become really useful when you're trying to debug or you're trying to reload some, live reload something. So say, for example, in the middle of our app, our tweet function stops working and we're trying to figure out why. At the point where we sus suspect that our tweet function no longer works, we can just overwrite the method to debug. So we don't actually have an app to show, so there's no context for this code. But here, I'm just console logging tweet and then like, just trying to figure out, like, is the tweet string just like not defined here for some reason? Since objects are first-class citizens in JavaScript, it's really easy to implement stuff like this, which is pretty rad. This is one of the reasons people think JavaScript is awesome. Because it is. Helen Hart's JavaScript forever. <laughs> so I've been skirting around this entire other programming paradigm, which is like 
which is classical programming, which I can't do anymore because it's important to understand because it makes sense as to why what you just learned felt so foreign to all of these like Java and C++ developers. So do you remember our history lesson? Brendan Eich made JavaScript look like Java. He designed the language to feel similar to other popular languages. And even though JavaScript is a prototypal language, Eich also wrote in some aspects that made the language, um, made JavaScript inheritance look like classical inheritance, even though they're somewhat different. So the new keyword is an example of that. So I call this the new debate, even though there's nothing inherently incorrect with using the new keyword. In fact, one could even argue that classical inheritance is just a subset of prototypal inheritance. So let's look at an example. So in this example, we can create a constructor, um, which is basically just a function that like spits out objects. Um, so we're calling this a make user function. And we then attach a tweet function to it, the make user.prototype.tweet bit. Um, and then we make me exist. And then we make me tweet. And I say, hi, Cascadia friends. Hi. <laughs> Um, so this is actually just a different way of doing exactly what we did before, um, although it does take a little bit more work to make mixins work using like this way. So we just learned all about how in JavaScript, objects can be prototypes of other objects, how any object can create new objects, how objects don't have to have the same properties as their prototype. JavaScript's just really, really malleable. So this is the way that I think of it. Um, JavaScript is like being on vacation, so, you know, like, Monday, like, you don't have to do the same thing on Monday that you do on Tuesday, and you can eat ice cream for, for breakfast and for lunch later, which is my kind of vacation. Um, so Java and other class-based languages um, are a little different. Instead of everything ha being an object with a prototype that can then be mutated at will, classes have what are called instances, and instances need to mimic their classes in every way. All instances that share the same class look and act the same way. So. This, to me, is kind of more like your work week. So you're up at the same time every day. <laughs> is this like sad? Like everyone's like, oh, work. <laughs> um, so you're like, you try to wake up at the same day. You try to get out the door at the same day. You like work from the same, same hours. And you like know where you're going to be vaguely at like what times of day. Um, so if we just like carry this analogy along, there's no reason that you couldn't have a regimented vacation. Like you can keep waking up at 7 a.m. and you can like keep being out the door at 8 and you can keep working from 9 to 5. Well, then, then it's not like not really a vacation. But, <laughs> but the other way around is much harder. So if you were to like roll into the office at 3 p.m. one day and then not at all the next day and then 11 a.m. the next day, you would have to worry about keeping your job. <laughs> so classes are an analogy for our work week example. They have routine, that their instances act the same way. We know their properties at any point, and we generally know like where they're going to be and what they're going to be doing when. Prototypes can be all over the place if you want them to be. Building a class system on top of prototypal inheritance is fairly easy, but the other way around is pretty hard. One method allows for a lot of freedom, and the other encourages routine. So this goes without saying, but developers get really opinionated on the right way to do something. So much so that sometimes even our linters will tell us to do something one way and like not explain why. So this is an example of a guy who's like, why is my linter telling me to do something one way and then like not letting me do it the other? And that's because the developer who wrote the linter like was trying to push him into like one paradigm over the other. So my point is, is that like lots of smart people think that using classical programming in JavaScript is silly. But there are also lots of people who think that a classical approach in JavaScript has merit. So if you've been keeping up with ES6, you've probably noticed that class is arriving as a keyword in JavaScript. So you can, I can understand arguments here that this just makes everything more confusing because JavaScript is still going to be proto like a prototypal language. But I consider it not egregious that ES6 is adding this functionality because it's really just, it's just syntax. And it's just, you know, still prototypal inheritance under the hood. And so it kind of makes it easier to program the way you want to program. If it wasn't obvious how I feel about this, I think it's kind of neat. Um, you can find beautiful solutions in lots of different ways. And if you couldn't, we'd probably all be out of jobs. Hopefully not, anyway. <laughs> so. So I'm really not here to say, like, prototype languages are awesome. Class languages suck. Do everything the way I tell you to do it. 
even though like we're at a web conference and I'm a web developer and I'm like up here and I'm supposed to be like an expert or something, like anything, <laughs> like anything else, it has nuance. And depending on what you're building, sometimes one of these approaches gets the job done better than the other. And it depends on like the developers and the resources and the knowledge you have. And most importantly, sometimes one of these approaches is just better for what you're trying to build. Um, sometimes you can build a work routine that's really inefficient and confusing. Sometimes when you're on vacation, you can eat too much ice cream and feel terrible. So protecting yourself against code that makes you want to cry is a process of iteration and code reviews and carefully contemplating tough problems even when it makes your head spin, not saying like, use this paradigm over this paradigm. So I said at the beginning of this talk that I wanted to make sure all of you who like wanted to know how to press the buttons on your like figurative camera had the resources that you need. So here are the things that I find helpful. This is going to be really obvious. Mozilla Developer Docs. Um, so this may seem obvious, but they're really clear cut. They're no-nonsense articles for not only understanding inheritance, but also like everything else about JavaScript and things that are web-related, and I'm a fan. Um, the next thing. Um, John Resig and Alex Sexton also write a great deal about prototypal inheritance because they are both in that jQuery world, and they both have like books and articles all about it. Um, the last one is Eric Elliott, who is sort of like, as like the third part of this piece is like super opinionated about both prototypal inheritance and um, functional programming as being the right ways to do something. And so his stuff is interesting to read simply because like he's so opinionated. Um, so back to this guy. So if you remember at the beginning of the talk, we learned about my grandfather and the story my grandmother always tells about him, about the camera that they had as newlyweds. And she always told the story because it was funny, but I've always gotten something a little bit different out of it. So you see, growing up, it wasn't my grandfather who took all the photos in the family. It, it wasn't him. He never picked up cameras. It was always my grandmother. She actually had so many photos that she had a room in her house filled with boxes of them. She went from not knowing how the camera buttons work to being the family photographer to being the family historian. Um, and the funny part is, is that I don't think she ever picked up a book on the history of photography or learned how light went through a camera, like all those things that my grandfather said were so important. She just really wanted to tinker and she just wanted to figure it out and so she did. So I also said at the beginning of this talk that I often feel overwhelmed when I'm learning new things and that I think that feeling is normal. Um, and when I'm feeling that way, I think about my grandmother and I think about how it was she, not my grandfather, who ended up with that room full of photographs because she knew that if she kept trying, it eventually click and she had faith that she would have fun in the process. I saw people say to Boz all the time, your husband is so smart. And that was totally true. But what I think all of those people missed was that Boz was smart too and that expertise and a love of learning comes in many different shapes and sizes. So I hope that you learned some stuff about prototypal inheritance, and I really hope that it clicked. But most importantly, I just want you to know it was like one super confused developer to another. Um, even though we might not get it now, we will figure it out. And to Cascadia and to all of you, thank you very much.